We now move on uh, to our to the uh, Alfred Wagner Medal Lecture by Leonard Bengtsson, Extra Tropical Cyclone and Climate. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Uh, I have the equipment there, and. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that oh, she takes care of that. Well, thank you very much. I, I uh, trust that everybody knows what extratropical cyclone is. Um, it was with some hesitation that I uh, selected this subject, um, uh, but I, I hope that uh, Alfred Wigner would have approved of it. Um, extratropical cyclones are the carriers of weather including extreme weather, and um, we need to predict them accurately, and we need to understand them. Damages uh, are not as high as for tropical cyclones, but um, certainly they are serious enough, and uh, uh, we are counting on the cost of uh, billions of euros in Europe alone from these storms. And certainly what may happen to them in a future climate uh, is of great importance uh, and um, there of course it has been left a little to the imagination of the public to perhaps dramatize this perhaps a little more than justified but I hope I would uh, put some clarity on it. So uh, let me just proceed um, and um, I um, would like to say a few words of course about Alfred Wegener's contribution to science just to put it in context he was actually in, involved quite a lot in meteorology and um, uh, we will then proceed to the understanding of the mechanism of tropical cyclones, extratropical cyclones and the role they play in the inner circulation and how they may change in a warmer climate. Well, uh, Alfred Wegener uh, had an interesting career as many people in meteorology, at least in the past, they started their careers in astronomy and then perhaps they thought that all the problems has been solved there so better proceed to meteorology. Um, I was as a boy very much intrigued by this. I couldn't understand why the predictions of, um, of uh, solar eclipses and, uh, and of the moon were so extremely accurate. Sorry to disturb you but if you can stand here you stay within the camera. All right, okay, I will stay here. Um, why they were so accurate and the weather forecast was so poor. And um, uh, that was one of the reasons that I later very, get very much fascinated by weather. Anyhow, um, uh, his main contribution was, of course, the theory of continental drift, which uh, he uh, produced when he was about 30 years old or 32. He also uh, did a lot of interesting work on weather balloons. He actually followed the weather in weather balloons and had actually with his brother had a record. He also wrote a very famous textbook in, in thermodynamics, which in fact where he actually was the first to point out the mechanism for precipitation at high latitude, which is now known as the bergeron findeisen theory. Uh, but they actually recognized a contribution by, by Wegener. And then, of course, he had several missions to Greenland, probably well as dramatic as those which he saw in the film uh, previously. That's the way he looked when he was young, and just when he has published his book about the um, uh, continental drift. And this is a way how it was received by the community. Uh, Wegener um, uh, wrote it to his wife, which was actually the daughter of Vladimir Köppen, who was professor in meteorology in Hamburg, uh, that he was very much intrigued by the fact that the coast of South America fitted so exactly against the west coast of Africa, and he had decided to pursue this. Well, this was interesting, perhaps, to have this in a love letter, but anyhow, <laughs> that was the way Wegener was. And, um, uh, of course, the um, geological experts um, were... Um, even more critical to Wegener, as some of them are to uh, uh, climate change today. Uh, the president of the American Philosophical Society didn't have very much over for Wegener. And uh, another US scientist, he said, if we start to believe this, we must forget everything 
we have learned in the last 70 years and start all over again. This is not bad to do that in science, of course. And the British geologist, he, uh, he, he has concluded that anyone uh, who value his reputation for scientific sanity would never dare to support such a theory. So he had a very hard time. Um, anyhow, um, um, this is a good example to follow. Uh, uh, even uh, certainly the mechanism of extratropical cyclones has also been debated a lot, but uh, I think we have now quite a lot of clarity about the subject. Uh, they are, of course, very important to predict, uh, uh, and perhaps the most important task for the meteorological services. They also play a very important function in the general circulation in transporting uh, heat and water from low to high latitudes, and uh, they are also controlling uh, uh, the more slowly varying weather which we are associated, for example, with the cold blocking. And um, certainly uh, we need or we must understand this, uh, how this may uh, react in a, f in, a, in a future climate. Well, I just have quoted some uh, fundamental papers here which covers a large span. I think uh, Dove, um, uh, in his book, Das Gesetz der Stürme, um, uh, now goes back to uh, uh, quite some time, 170 years, um, actually was the first to point it out that they were related to uh, air masses of different temperature. But he didn't really couple it specifically to any thermodynamic theory. That was actually done by Max Margulis, uh, now almost 100 years ago, who clearly indicated that this was something which was, follows more the second law of thermodynamics, namely it was simply a mechanism whereby um, uh, energy, potential energy was converted into kinetic energy. And Edward Lorenz, in his very famous paper on available potential energy and the maintenance of the circulation, he clarified this concept even more in detail. Now, the prediction of extratropical storms uh, have, of course, was very, very poor in the past. And uh, it was actually a great frustration for the meteorological services because there were so many accidents. And in fact, the uh, uh, director at the time of the British Met Office um, uh, actually was uh, said to be so depressed by this, uh, Sir Fitzroy, um, that he actually committed suicide. And, but in fact, in recent decades, we have seen a major improvement. And in fact, I think I can say that it's been spearheaded to partly by the European Centre in Reading, uh, and I think that um, it, it, it has really improved quite a lot. And um, in fact, the reason to this is due to many factors, certainly better observation, but also to significantly improved modeling, which has been possible with the help of supercomputers. And here is one example, uh, which goes back now some 20 years uh, from ECMWF. This is actually a um, um, developing storm uh, well into the forecast, 84 hours, and uh, the uh, color of the arrows here indicated the temperature of the air masses. So here we have a very warm air mass, and here we have colder air, and um, the uh, um, intensity of the arrows, of course, indicate the wind speed. And then in 12 or 24 hours later, this uh, storm has developed into an intense cyclone here uh, to the uh, north uh, west of, of northern Scotland and indicating just the tremendous speed by which the system developed. But also, I think in this case, we were very pleased that we could actually predict it so far into the future, which was, of course, one of the key things we had to do. And here's another example just to indicate how these storms are actually organizing the weather pattern in a systematic way. And we can see here, for example, the, uh, the middle high clouds, uh, which are associated with rainfall. Uh, we see what is very typical, the clear air behind the front, uh, 
and then the convective storms, the red areas here, which are developing behind the storm. So in fact, when this system develops, they organize the weather uh, as a function of the dynamics and thermodynamics of these storms. And this figure just illustrates the great importance of uh, resolution in the models, uh, how accurately we can do it. This is observation. This is this particular experiment, which was for its time rather unique. And this was more or less the situation which we had previously, uh, namely very coarse resolution models, which were not able to reproduce its features and, and had rather large errors in the calculation because of aliasing problem. So the role of the extra tropical cycle in the gender circulation uh, indicate that now that we need to be able to do the climate experiment with a resolution which requires the order of 50 to 100 kilometers at least. That is necessary. And this is not until very recently this has been done. For example, all the experiment for the climate assessment of the IPCC were using models of much coarser resolution, more of the type uh, I indicated in the recently. And, oh, sorry. Um, then the diagnostic um, uh, diagnosis of these storms has benefited very much from a Lagrangian tracking uh, feature technique, which has developed uh, to a large extent by my closest colleague in Reading, um, Kevin Hodges. And in fact, many of the figures I will show will indicate uh, the strengths of these analyses in, in understanding um, the extratropical storms. And here we will now uh, simply um, use a, a series of weather maps six hours apart covering 32 years. And in these we will identify the particular storms uh, simply using the vorticity as a measure. And that follows exactly very much Dover's idea from 1840, interesting enough. But of course, he couldn't do that very well with the lack of data and lack of methodology he has. And um, then I think that um, uh, this is a type of um, examples of how this uh, technique works. This is just now being applied on the Hurricane Katrina and uh, the, it is the development of these storms for every six hours and the color of these um, uh, dots indicates essentially the wind speed uh, which occurs at the time. So this is essentially a way of a dynamic way of following these storms. And this is now um, a sort of a summary of what happens to uh, the winter climate uh, over 32 years in the present climate. And um, if I would have put up here uh, the name of uh, ERA 40 and ECAM 5, you would hardly been able to say which of them is based upon observation and which is based upon a climate simulation. And in fact, this is the one which is a climate simulation and this is based upon uh, 30 years or 32 years of observation. And these two curves here indicate areas where cyclones are being formed. And the color pattern indicates the frequency of cyclone and intensity of the genesis. And in fact, you can clearly see here, this is actually now the Rocky Mountains. So a main genesis area of cyclones is just to the east of the Rocky Mountains. Another area of less intensity as is along the east coast of the United States. There are actually two different mechanisms. One is due to Lee wave effect. This is due to thermal effect, heat from the ocean. And you can see almost exactly the same thing here in the simulation. This is just an indication what climate models can do today. And uh, the typical um, genesis of cyclones over the Mediterranean in the winter is certainly well known by, uh, by the meteorologist. And these other two curves here is simply the density of cyclone in each specific grid point and indicates simply here 
where we have the area where cyclones are moving. And again, you can see the remarkable accuracy by which this particular model is able to reproduce this statistical quantity. Uh, now, the, uh, we, we next actually concentrate on intense storms. And in this particular case, we selected the uh, 100 most intense extratropical storms um, for the winter season. And um, uh, we uh, y y y y looked upon uh, both the vorticity, uh, we looked upon the uh, total precipitation within five degrees of the center, equivalent to about one million square kilometers, and we also checked the uh, surface pressure minima and surface pressure tendencies. And this is an example of the, um, um, of the a composite of 100 most intense storms. The first one, uh, two sets, indicates wind field um, and pressure. This is wind field. And, and the thickness of the pattern that is a thermal, which is the, the gradient here of the thermal field indicates a measure of the available energy. And this is the, uh, the precipitation. This second set of curves is take place when the storm has reached its maximum precipitation intensity. And this is the time when the storm has reached its maximum intensity. And this ha actually happens very quickly. And this indicates now a time evolution of how rapidly the pressure is falling by more than one uh, millibar per hour. Uh, the blue curve here is the intensity of precipitation. The time here is 30 hours, so you can get an idea that, that the, this process takes the order of something like uh, the order of two days. The red curve is vorticity, and the green curve is the maximum wind speed. And it's interesting to see here that the very rapid build-up of the storm and an equally rapid collapse of the storm. And this has nothing to do with, with uh, um, uh, turbulence or, or, or any dissipation. This is a pure dynamical effect which happens when the model has reached occlusion, when, so to say, the, uh, the, the storm has closed up itself so it cannot convert any more uh, uh, energy uh, into kinetic energy. And this is just the same thing from the uh, European Center's reanalysis exercise, which we can consider as a sort of validation. And um, in fact, if you recall the previous curve, it is in fact uh, practically identical, except that this uh, era 40 is actually slightly weaker in the intensity. As you can see from this curve here, uh, where the um, uh, 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 the thick blue line is actually the model result, and the weaker blue line is actually the same thing from the reanalysis data. Now, of course, you can argue then that the model is overpredicting the storm. But anyhow, when we then did the same comparison with a new reanalysis, with a higher resolution, more close to the models, then in fact uh, the difference to the um, to the era 40 and this interim reanalysis was very close to in fact, but this couldn't be compared directly as we only have data here for 20 years. But anyhow, we, are, we have very good reason to believe that in this particular case, um, uh, the simulation was probably slightly better than the reanalysis data. But anyhow, the agreement is in its principle very, very similar. This is just an indication how the tilt of the storm, the vertical axis of the storm, and for those of you who are familiar with dynamical theory, uh, the, uh, the tilt of the storm where the axis is sort of backwards from the movement of the storm is simply a measure of the energy which can be released. And then uh, when the storm develops, um, then the vertical axis of it becomes, so to say, more barotropic, and then the energy cannot be converted anymore, and this just indicates 
the very, very fast speed. This is 12 hours between these two lines. So it's a very, very rapid process. And uh, this is an, an example between the uh, model result and the, and the uh, reanalysis is again indicating very, very similar properties. Again, an example of uh, that we, the models are doing a pretty realistic job here. Um, this is just uh, going back now to Ed Lorenz, and this is the main point that um, it has to be highlighted that the strengths of the extratropical storms are not related, as many believe, to uh, water vapor. They are related to the amount of energy we have in the atmosphere. This is why we have much stronger storms in the winter. So they are a measure of the, of the available potential energy and the conversion. And this is just an example of, of the conversion of energy which goes from the zonal part of the available potential energy to the eddy part of that, converted rapidly into kinetic energy. And then a part of that is being transported back into the zonal part and, of course, is also being dissipated. And um, this is just an example of how much of this energy from the storm which is providing momentum for the large-scale circulation, which is actually larger than the part which is related to the uh, meridional circulation in the, in the subtropics. Uh, this is the northern hemisphere winter, and on the southern hemisphere we have very little stationary waves, and there, of course, this process is dominating completely. And um, this is just an example again of the transition that this occurs um, uh, uh, at the top of the troposphere um, 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 uh, and, and it's very marked. And in this particular case, with the Lagrangian uh, technique of falling storm, it was indeed possible to simply calculate the amount of kinetic energy which is transported out of an individual storm. And this is, oops, uh, this is simply an example, uh, this is a function of distance, how extremely strong this energy is. So this is simply now a very detailed technique we now have developed to really specifically explore individual storms and the way they interact with the environment. And through that, of course, we can do very detailed validation of this process. Now, the extratropical cyclones in a warmer climate is something which has, of course, been uh, of a very great interest uh, to the public. And uh, we have heard the most dramatic uh, reports uh, how uh, dangerous these uh, are likely to be. Uh, at first thought, of course, one uh, would ask himself, uh, since they are clearly are driven by the um, available potential energy in the atmosphere, um, uh, when we may have uh, larger warming at high latitudes and at low latitudes, then this gradient is likely to be, be reduced, and consequently there will be less energy available. Um, so I think that, uh, on the other hand, there is more water vapor in a warmer climate, so that can contribute. So I think it requires a detailed study, and I will devote the remaining time to this project, which I think is interesting. This is also very recently, it will be published in a paper in Journal of Climate next month. Uh, so the question is, are there any physical reasons why tropical storms will be more intense? Uh, do we have any evidence uh, that this actually had happened? And uh, are present GCMs able to represent these intense storms? I think we already have seen some evidence that that is presumably the case, assuming we can have reasonably detailed calculation. And what are the evidence from a climate change experiment? Uh, op there is, of course, a very uh, tricky problem here that extreme storms are pretty rare and we need very long and reliable observation records and, of course, indications are that uh, several decades of, of homogeneous data are needed. Um, uh, there are certainly still general problems to detect extreme storms in sufficient detail uh, 
as records are insufficient and, um, and certainly the situation is there. And we have that problem, for example, with the um, um, uh, tropical storms in the Atlantic, where we are now pretty sure that the increase of tropical storms are not related to that they are more intense, but in fact that we can observe them much better with the present observing system. And I think now that the, uh, most of the community has now agreed to that that is a case. Also, that has been um, some um, um, scientific fights about it. Um, but anyhow, we have to be very critical about this. And um, I think the first uh, view on extratropical storm, uh, whether it has been more intense, there are um, there has been studies, um, um, some of them are listed here, um, where um, people have been uh, explored areas where we have good records. The North Sea is such a region, and this is an example now of the intense storms in the area around the British Isles, the North Sea, and the Norwegian Sea, which covers now an area of 100 and uh, 30 or 40 and 40 years, and um, uh, the, um, the curve here indicates now the percentiles of, uh, of the 95 and 99 percentile, so that is just an indication of the intense storms. Well, what has um, uh, been something which has been very much uh, uh, discussed, of course, has been this relatively rapid increase between 1970 and 1990 or so where there was actually clearly an increase in this area. But of course, uh, if one go back a little further in time, we see that they have actually gone down from the end of the 19th centuries to around 1970 or so. And in recent years, they have actually an indication. So here we have a situation where we have very low frequency variation and where substantial records are needed in order to really uh, come up with a, a sensible assessment about this. So the fact is that we don't get very much help from the historical record. And uh, this is, a, a, it just indicates that here we have to work with data for uh, more than 100 years. So the question is now what can we uh, argue out from general physical theory? Um, um, uh, uh, as the extra tropical storm depends on available potential energy, which is proportional to the temperature variance, mid latitude, and um, um, uh, so to what extent will it change the number and intensity of the storms? I think we have to put a big question mark there because we can argue in both directions, and probably one would say this would presumably imply slightly less. Now, the release of latent heat contributes certainly to the storm, not as much as one would think, because these storms develop so quickly, so the eustrophic adjustment theory doesn't really have time to adjust, so we have to set probably there. The third one is, of course, tropical storms which move into uh, extratropical regions, and there, I think, because they are more driven by the latent heat release, there, I think, we have to set yes and also the question about upper level cyclogenesis, we don't really are very much sure about that either. So we, we are not very much guided by the theory uh, by trying to do this. So I think that um, what we always can do in such a case, we can do a numerical experiment. At least that could be provide us with some additional information. And that has been done here Actually, um, the way uh, one can work nowadays, um, uh, of course, you don't have to do all the experiments. Experiments are often being done. It's just to get access to the data and try to um, undertake some experiment. And here we were fortunate in reading that we were provided data uh, uh, by the Hamburg uh, ECAM 5 model which are run at um, very high resolution, it's equivalent to about 50 kilometers global for, for both the present climate and uh, we also have here 32 years in the end of the present century. Assuming then um, one of these IPCC scenarios, which is one of the middle ones. 
And in fact, the technique has been identical to what I show you for the present climate. Now, this is just an example of, um, uh, of the storms in, in tidal latitude. And I have indicated here storms which are reaching 12 Bo Beaufort, which, of course, must be considered as a very intense storm. And um, uh, uh, or everywhere where in these 32 winters we have had a storm uh, more than uh, 12 Beaufort, we have indicated uh, a dot, and the color of the dot indicate the intensity. And you see that um, the area to the south of Greenland is apparently where you shouldn't really go if you're afraid of intense extratropical storms, which I think most meteorologists are aware of. And, um, and uh, in fact, if we look upon the simulation uh, uh, some 100 years later, we see not very much of a difference. Uh, it seems to be more or less the uh, same number of spots, more or less distributed equally. So we have to look a little more. And this is, again, now a uh, sort of a composite of uh, the storms in the present and in the future climate. And here we have drawn with a thick line where we have um, the um, um, future climate and with a background color here, that is what you have already seen, that is from the, what you call climate of the 20th century. And if we look upon the typical structural storms, at the first instant, they look very similar. Um, the only thing which stands out is that we have more precipitation uh, in these storms. But strangely enough, the maximum wind speed is slightly less. Uh, and the vorticity is about the same, and there is practically no significant difference between the deepening with the same speed. Maybe I know a little deeper here, but that doesn't have any coupling to the wind speed. So in fact, at first approximation, uh, the changes in the conditions um, by increasing greenhouse gases and increasing the, the overall temperature doesn't seem to affect the properties of these storms in any particular way, and uh, in, except for precipitation. And um, to summarize this, I think, uh, looking upon the storms, we have an increase of the global precipitation by about 6%. Along the storm tracks, the precipitation increased by 11%. But of course, in some parts, there are very intense maximum precipitation, which I will come back to uh, in a moment. So I think that to support this, uh, uh, we also undertook a study, what we can call in the grid point space. We looked into every individual grid point this is all previously has been the dynamical um, uh, system following the storms. And um, this is just an example which we have now taken the absolute extreme that is the 99.9 percentile. That is every thousand case. This is the 1,000 or, or the, let's see now, that is the order of 20 storms which, which included here because it is about 20,000 storms in all these 32 winters. And that uh, indicates, again, these very strong winds around Greenland, but of course generally in the North Atlantic here, but uh, nothing particular. And if we then go to the situation for the future climate, we couldn't see very much of a difference. So we have to look upon the difference maps, which is absolute now really the red indicate grid points where we are likely to have some intensification, and the blue indicates where we have uh, weakening storms. Totally uh, integrated over the whole area, there is practically no difference. But there are certain areas with some slight intensification. Um, there is a band here um, uh, over uh, towards northern Europe and, and uh, between Scotland and Iceland where I think the maximum wind speed goes up by a meter or two per second, which is, in fact, not very much, since uh, the maximum wind speed here at 925 hectopascal is about sort of 40, 50 meters per second. But then we have a weakening in the Mediterranean, and we have a weakening also here between Iceland and Greenland, which is a bit surprising. 
that weakening will occur in the Mediterranean region is in all likelihood related to a northward trend of the, of the storm tracks related to the tropical changes related to a warmer climate. But the fact that we have a weakening uh, around Greenland is something which is difficult to understand. Maybe some explanation could be that uh, the model has actually a relatively modest warming in this area, and some model even to have a cooling, but this has a very modest warming, and a larger warming here to the south. So here in this region, we have actually a slight intensification in the gradient of the sea surface temperature. That could be an explanation for this particular case, but there is nothing dramatic in any way about it. And if we then look upon different areas, uh, whether for, for different seasons, whether the storms will become more intense or less intense, then I've indicated by red when they are actually uh, are a higher intensity, sort of cases with more than 12 Beaufort, and it's essentially only in the winter time in the Arctic and the northern Europe in other areas is rather a weakening. Uh, the summer indications here uh, in the Atlantic and uh, the Pacific uh, or in the northern hemisphere is actually related to tropical storms which uh, enter the area. So I think there is nothing worrying about this, uh, more or less supporting the idea that the winds are likely to become, the, the maximum wind is likely to become less extreme, presumably because we are reducing the available potential energy of the storm due to higher high latitude uh, warming. Now, what is, of course, more serious is how the precipitation will change. And this is just an example of the hourly uh, precipitation intensity at this very high percentage. It is, again, I think, the very top end of the intense rainfall. And um, that is actually of the order in the, in the key area here, something like 7 to 8 millimeters per uh, our, which is quite a lot since we're talking about an area which is the order of, uh, of um, uh, at least 100 by 100 kilometers, so 10,000 square kilometers. And of course, we know the area here where we have areas uh, where it always is heavy precipitation. And this actually shows a difference. And then when we look upon that, it looks actually quite worrisome because um, the extreme precipitation here in many parts are actually increasing by more than 50%. And uh, here, for example, the red color here is 40%. So all over the whole storm track area uh, in the Arctic, we see a very, very marked increase in the intense precipitation. And that is something which follows clearly from theory and in the way the climate system responds to the uh, um, hydrological cycle, uh, the hydrological cycle responds to climate warming. But, but I cannot go too much into these details. Um, but, but that is rather basic result. And um, if we look now upon a percentage increase in this high frequency precipitation, that is now, um, um, if we take the mean for uh, the winter for the northern hemisphere extratropics is about eight uh, millimeter, but if we take southern Europe, there is a reduction of, of about 20% in the winter precipitation and an increase over northern Europe by some 15%. If we then go to the summer, uh, we see a drastic decrease in the, in the southern Europe of almost half the precipitation and some reduction also at Northern Europe is quite insignificant. Now, if we then now go to the 99 percentile, that is, oops, uh, that is actually uh, um, sort of uh, the, uh, the hundred most, or, or the one percent of the most intense storms, if you can put it that way. Still, there is actually a reduction in Southern Europe, but now we have an increase here. And if you go to the absolute maximum, which of course is not particularly representative, we see some increases even in Southern Europe. So I think there is um, rather um, 
marked change in the whole way the pet precipitation pattern is likely to operate and indicate, of course, this area where the storm tracks are changing position. So I think the problem is more so much any changes in the storm track themselves, but in the positions they are taking um, in, 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 in the simulation, which is also uh, confirmed by uh, other model studies quite well. So in, in conclusion, I think uh, we can say there is an overall reduction in the number of extratropical storms. This covers virtually all season. And uh, the, um, uh, the, if we look upon the, uh, even the more intense storms, we see even there uh, some reduction in the number. Um, the largest reduction in the most uh, intense storms uh, occur during winter and spring. Uh, there is some slight increase uh, in summer. Uh, as I said, in, in most likelihood related to tropical cyclones which are entering the area being transformed into extratropical storms. Um, we also point out, as been done in some cases, that it's quite misleading to use surface pressure as a proxy for wind speed because um, uh, that is um, it's too simple and in fact uh, one has to calculate the actual wind speed directly to really be sure about it. Um, there is a slight poleward movement of the cyclones having the effect that the number of cyclones in northern Europe and Arctic is practically unchanged. Uh, for the same reason, the number of cyclones in the Mediterranean region are proportionally reduced. This is something which I think is being supported by many other models and of course is included in IPCC. Uh, there is increase in the number of intense cyclones in the Arctic, but there is no clear tendency in northern Europe there are some increase in the very intense storms, but not very much. Um, uh, the um, distribution of storms uh, as a function of maximum wind speed is similar in both area 40. The wind speed are systematically stronger in ECM5 that we have seen. And um, the, this particularly uh, regional intensification over uh, Western Europe, um, uh, we uh, suggest that this is related to this particular response of the sea surface temperature south of Greenland. Um, we see no indication of any effect of the high level of latent heat. Generally, release of late, additional latent heat in the warmer climate appears to have little effect on the extreme exotropical cyclone, presumably because of the way precipitation are organized uh, in along frontal zones, and you don't have the time to simply convert it into wind because of the great speed by which they develop. So I think in summary the um, precipitation increase is probably the marked thing um, by 11 percent. Uh, uh, in some areas uh, we can even have more than 50 percent. So in conclusion that the extreme precipitation in a warmer climate we clearly fall outside the range of the present climate, while extreme winds are likely to fall within the range of the present climate. So this, I think, is the main conclusion from this particular study, which will now come in general climate in next month. Thank you. Would you like to take a few questions? Oh, I can do that. Are there questions to this presentation? Yes, uh, uh, Eric Smith from NASA Goddard. Pierre Morel always used to, um, uh, I, is Pierre in the room? You never cannot, know when he's going to show up at a meeting. But uh, Pierre always used to counsel um, some distrust of any modeling experiment that concluded something about precipitation in which the mechanism of precipitation and the vertical circulation wasn't actually resolved and in fact would stress that a, a model experiment in which you warmed the climate and uh, presumably produced more evaporation had no other choice but to produce more precipitation and so uh, 
he was always a bit skeptical about these things. And I just, without I, playing devil's advocate, perhaps, you know, in representing Pierre's views, how would you, how, how could you answer that kind of skepticism without perhaps feeling that you need to really defend yourself? Well, you know, I, I am always very skeptical, in particular about what I'm doing myself. And I think that the purpose of this study was to indicate what we would achieve with a model of somewhat higher resolution, which previously has been done. And um, the, the main part of the study is, of course, a very detailed uh, validation exercise uh, versus the present climate. The result with the future climate, of course, we, remains to be seen what is happening. Uh, but uh, I think that um, I believe that some of the, certainly from a qualitative point of view, this is the result I would have expected. That uh, the um, uh, intensity doesn't necessarily have to be that increased, but that you would have more precipitation because uh, water vapor uh, follows uh, Klausus Klapperon, we know that very well, while the uh, total precipitation, of course, is controlled by the, net ev by the evaporation, which, of course, is controlled by the energy balance at the ground. Uh, and uh, we have very good reason to believe that that is increasing much lower than the water vapor. So I, I think that um, uh, I have no problem with these results. Uh, I would have a problem when people are arguing that storms in a future climate uh, will have to be much stronger. I don't think that case has been made. I think so. Here, I think I take from that point a somewhat cautious view, which is supported by this experiment, at least. Other questions? Seems no? to Let's thank the, thank the speaker again. All right. Thank you very much.